Yep, and we're live. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to another NIDA in Conversation. My name is Bryony McKim, and joining me today is the incredible Emily Dash, who is a writer, performer, producer, um, an all-round amazing creative. Thank you for joining us here today, Emily. Thanks, Bridie, for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh, no worries. And today we are also being joined by Kelly and Kerry, who are our Auslan interpreters. Um, I would also like to start by acknowledging the Turrbal and Nugara people, who are the traditional custodians of the land in which I'm on today, and also the Gadigal people, who are the traditional custodians of the land in which Emily is on today. I want to pay my respects to Elders past, present and future, and extend that respect to any Aboriginal or First Nations people joining us here today. Always was, always will be Aboriginal, Aboriginal land. Emily Dash. So tomorrow we are celebrating International Day of People with Disability, which is so exciting. We get our own day. Um, what will you be doing to celebrate? Tomorrow I will actually be going to the theatre, which I think is a good way of celebrating International Day of People with Disability, because it means that we're out and about and visible and, you know, taking up space in the community. So that is what I'll be doing. But I also have a few things lined up for events and things that may not be on the actual day mm -hmm. but are connected to International Day of Disability. So, for example, I think it's the 17th of December. I will be on a panel um, for the Inner West Council um, Inclusive Film Festival. Cool. Um, so that'll be good. Amazing. They are screening one of my films and that'll be really great. Cool. Um, and so what do you, what does International Day of People with Disability mean for you? Because not a lot of people are aware that it's a thing and aware that it's important. So what do you think is the importance of it? I think the importance of International Day of People with Disability is that Again, it's a chance for us and our achievements to be celebrated and to be recognised and to claim that space for kind of pride. I know that we have Disability Pride Month and things like this and all sorts of events around that, but I think that International Day is just another day of being able to focus on that and put people with disability front and centre. Um, but what I would also say is that as with all of these international days, um, every day should be international day of people with disabilities. We should always be acknowledging and celebrating and recognizing people. And not only that, but having a focus on making things um, accessible and inclusive. Absolutely, 100%, 100%. <laughs> um, now tell me, how did you actually get involved in writing and producing and all the creative stuff you do in the arts? Yeah, great. It's quite a story. Um, but it is. <laughs> when I finished my uni degree in 2014, I, I graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology and Gender Studies, and I had done honours um, and, and received, you know, first class for that. Woo! But yeah, um, but the thing about achieving first class honors is that it when you're doing a thesis destroys your social life. So I <laughs> decided to take a year off. Mm -hmm. But 
you know me, right? Even if I take a year off, it's not really like, oh, like I'm always thinking of things to do and new places to go. Yeah, you're pretty but notorious I, for it. Yeah, <laughs> as are you. So um, I decided to kind of reconnect with my sort of creative roots. And I um, found an opportunity for a dance class with uh, four people with disabilities. And um, I went to this dance class and it was so much fun. And then at the end, the person who was running it asked if I had ever been involved in theater. And I, I, I sort of said no, and I sort of didn't think that the industry was open to me and people like me at that stage. Mm. Um, and so I said no, but I would like to. And, and she said that she knew of an opportunity um, for a theatre company that was looking for two new actors with disabilities. So the next day, um, I went to an audition and I, I was cast um, in a show at Carriage Works. And sort of from there, the opportunities and things like that, and the relationships that I made just kept coming and kept being fruitful. So I, I've been very lucky in that sense that, you know, opportunities kind of come to me and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Yeah, and you're the best person for the job. Thanks. <laughs> so, and you've been like doing incredible things in the industry and in the biz. Um, you're one of the busiest people I know. So thank you for making time for us. Um, so what has been your favourite project to date? Oh, God, it's hard to I know a favourite project. I, I think that, um, you know, every, every project sort of has its own things that it teaches you and that it brings to your life and that you bring to it. So mm. it's hard to pick a favorite project. But, um, you know, I, I love and I'm very proud of all the things that I've done um, in the, you know, in the community arts type space, because that's where I, sort of started and I want to give a massive shout out to um, a company called Midnight Feast, yeah. um, which is an inclusive theatre company that has, uh, you know, is very grateful for the relationship that we have with NIDA. Um, so I just would like to give a shout out to that. For sure. Um, yeah, so we've been very lucky in that we've performed in places like the Opera House. Um, so I'm very proud of my work um, with Midnight Feast as well. Of course, amazing. Um, we talk a lot about, well, in our conversations, you and I, and more generally in the disability arts world, we talk a lot about inclusive practice and inclusive work, um, but not a lot of people actually really understand what it is and the nuances of inclusive practice. Do you have any thoughts or um, can you explain what it means to you? It's a very big conversation. I think that we could talk about this all day. Yeah. But I think one of the major things for me in terms of inclusive work and inclusive practice is around authentic casting and mm -hmm. authentic representation. And what that means is that when you're making a show and you have a character that's from, whether it's a disabled character or some other character from an underrepresented uh, community, I think that, you know, it's very important to connect with that community and make sure that 
you get the representation right. And of course, that the right person with the right lived experience of that is cast in that role. Um, and those are just two, you know, basic things that really need to be more common in the industry and not something that, you know, it's still very much, oh, look how amazing this is that this project has been authentically cast and things like this. That needs to be um, just normalized more, yeah, I think. The norm, the standard. Absolutely. And then I think there are things to do. There's a lot of work to be done around sort of making performance accessible in terms of things like um, live captioning, things like audio description, um, Auslan, things like that. Um, and there are ways to do that which are not just add-ons at the end of a process, but mm can be incorporated into a creative work. Um, so that's, it's something that I'm certainly very interested in exploring. It's called the aesthetics of access. Cool. And I think, um, yeah, a lot more work and uh, uh, knowledge needs to be gained around that. Yeah, the aesthetics of access. That's yes. amazing. I personally have never heard of that. That sounds really, really cool. So is it something in terms of integrating accessibility within the creative work and making it a part yes. of the creativity? Yeah. Amazing. So that it's not just an add-on at the end. Yeah. And what do you think are the barriers of that make it really difficult to make, like, um, that type of practice or any accessible work, the benchmark and the standard within our industry, what have you come across? I think lack of knowledge. Mm. Um, I think lack of knowledge is a real um, barrier. Yeah. And I also think lack of money. I think that... <laughs> the age-old um, problem? Yeah, the kind of universal problem. <laughs> yeah is that, um, you know, people go, oh, I've done, and I've done this myself before in my work, when you're working on a limited kind of budget, you know, there are compromises that have to be made. And, you know, so what needs to be properly supported mm -hmm. so that, accessible features are not something that are just optional I mm. guess yeah um I think something for me as a, excuse me I think something for me as a wheelchair user also is that when you're looking into the accessibility of venues I think it's important that venues make it clear that they're wheelchair accessible, not just for audience members, but also for performance. And that yeah. is not standard practice. No. And it really, really should be. And frankly, I don't understand why it isn't. Mm. Um, because as much as people with disabilities our audience members can be audience members um, and it's great to support that. We also need to be acknowledged um, as potential creatives as well. Mm -hmm. So what do you think we can be doing as a community um, to make ourselves, to kind of bridge the gap? I mean, of course, it's not only our responsibility, other people um, of all abilities and non-disabled people need to be doing that work as well. Mm -hmm. um, but how can we be, you know, 
becoming the norm, becoming the benchmark, becoming the standard? What can we be doing to um, be a part of the diversity conversation as well? Because even in that big conversation we're all having at the moment, mm. um, disability mm. is often left off that list. Yeah. Um, so what do you think we need to be aware of as a community? I think, yeah, I mean, it's easy to say and not that um, easy to do, but I mm. think it's important to have the confidence to uh, know what it is that you want to do and where you want to go and have the confidence to stand up and say, this is what I need and this is how, you know, we're going to make it accessible and be willing to have those really difficult conversations. Yeah in terms of venues and in terms of the people you want to work with and in terms of the projects that you take on and the opportunities that you carve out for yourself, um, be willing to have those really uncomfortable conversations about this is not going to work for me and this mm. is not something that I can stand for. Um, and this is how you need to fix it because if we shy away from those really difficult conversations, then um, no changes will be made. Yeah, it's yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? But I think that equally, what I would say. I think that a lot of these discussions, how do I put this? I think that first, a lot of these discussions, as you said, exclude people with disability. Um, and I think so we need to make ourselves present at those events and, mm. and, and make sure that we're visible in terms of those discussions, but also I think that there needs to be um, a lot of these diversity discussions can often be very polarizing yeah. in that either you're on the side of inclusive representation and, and all those kind of things, or you're not. Mm -hmm. And so I think there needs to be an understanding of nuance in these discussions and that we need to work together um, and not make it difficult, as I say, for, for people to have those discussions because if we go, you know, there is a time and a place for strong advocacy mm -hmm. um, and there is a time and a place I think for a bit of a <laughs> softer I guess approach and yeah. and so it's about judging each situation and I guess when we can I mean there are instances where obviously people will feel alienated and challenged and things like that. But where we can to be encouraging and inclusive of all perspectives to make change, I don't know if that makes sense. It totally makes sense. I hear you saying like, inclusivity in terms of every aspect of that work yes so being open to differing opinions and being empathetic and um yeah. not making it a binary thing but um being really open to all the options we can take yeah. and um having a wide and nuanced understanding of how we can move forward as an industry and in terms of our inclusive practice and our place in the industry yeah um, yeah, because we yeah. deserve a place. And Absolutely. it's and as you say, sometimes it is hard 
to have those difficult conversations. Um, and it's, it's an yeah. whole, yeah, it's a whole other level of work we need to do, which can be taxing, yeah. but it's important. Yeah, and it's quite easy to get very uh i don't want to say aggressive but very like uh feel the injustice of it yeah 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 totally yeah and i think so we need to stay open and flexible and adaptive and things like this yeah people with disabilities are we're good at that, I think. <laughs> we're, good, we're good at pivoting. We're good Absolutely. at making things work. Totally. Um, so I'm curious, because you've spoken about how you kind of started out in your career and taking opportunities and working within the industry. Um, if you were to start again, knowing everything you know now, um, is there anything you would change or is there anything you would reconsider or... Um, would you take the same steps you have or in doing so, what would be your advice for people starting out who want a career that you have? Oh, goodness, that's such an interesting question. Thanks. Um, I, I'm very happy with the steps that I've taken because I think a lot of basically the steps that I've taken have just come down to being open and, and being receptive to people when the opportunities come to you mm-hmm. and also kind of filling yourself with inspiration and, and um, creating those opportunities for yourself and, and knowing that you can do that, having the confidence to do that. Um, I think... Mm, so those are the things that I would tell people um, and mentors, informal and formal mentors, totally. uh, like really super important, both within the community and otherwise, and even not just mentors, but being aware of the people who are around, who are paving the way for you. Um, because I know that you and I, Bridie, are more than willing to kind of nurture the next kind of generation of us. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. So come yeah, on, come all. Open to those kind of situations and not being afraid to reach out. Um, what I would say is that this industry is boundaries are important and knowing what you will and won't stand for are important um and um i think the longer that i spend in this industry i know the people who are really accessible and inclusive to work with Mm-hmm. And equally, I know the people who aren't. And that is <laughs> yes. okay. Like, yeah. it is okay to draw a line in the sand of these are the situations that I will, you know, reconsider working in. Yeah, for sure. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. That totally makes sense. Um, I just want to mention while we're at this point, um, if anyone who's joining us live has any questions for Emily within this chat, um, please put it in the comments or in a chat or however you can access um, the space. Um, yeah, we don't love... fight. We're very friendly. We're very friendly. We're very welcoming and understanding to everyone. So yeah, bring it on if you've got anything for us. Um, Emily, you mentioned before that um, you know having good mentors is really important to you and it has been really instrumental for you. Um, yeah. I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot here, but do you know the best piece or can remember the best piece of advice? you've ever received from anyone in the biz or outside the biz that has really um, 
you know, you've really found useful? Yeah, again, I keep coming back to this, but it's about being open and and not being afraid to go after what it is that you want. And um because you will find people who are willing to help you. And also don't be afraid to walk away from mm. a situation that is not serving what it is that you want to do in, in, in life. Yeah. I think as diverse artists, we have this compulsion often to take every opportunity <laughs> given I don't us. know what you're talking about what yeah. no <laughs> it's very true um, <laughs> um whether or not you know and often it's about being it's about following your own intuition mm -hmm. because you know what is right for you and what isn't because there have been opportunities where I have instantly thought, yeah, that looks great. And then I've, you know, come to realize a bit later that maybe it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Hmm. And so it's about taking the time and space to know what it is you really want to do because there will come a stage where you can't do everything yeah. and that's fine too. You're no good to anyone if you're exhausted and burnt out and totally. all that kind of thing. Um, yeah. So it's... It's that element of self care as well and self compassion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that that is really important. Yeah, Emily, you talk a lot about um taking up space and being visual mm -hmm. and being in the room. And um, for a lot of disabled people, that can be quite confronting when you're yeah. the only disabled person in the room, or someone from any diverse identity or background. When yeah. You're the only person with that identity in the room um what strategies do you use when you're feeling a bit vulnerable or um you might feel a bit um out of depth or maybe you don't feel like the situation as in, is as inclusive as it needs to be um what strategies do you use for me it's really about connecting with my values and remembering why it is that I'm in this situation and the things that inspire me to dig deep and move forward. Mm -hmm. So what, what is this opportunity in service of? Is it in service of uh, making space for others so that this situation doesn't happen again? Is it in service of making a story more balanced and appropriate um, when it goes out into the world? And also just knowing who outside of that situation you can depend on mm. to go to and debrief and who will support you because it's very, very difficult to be the only person in a room and to understand that there is no situation in which you can reasonably be expected to carry the experience of a whole community. For sure. And if you are ever asked to do that, then it is okay to first take the space and make sure that you feel safe enough to do this. But 
then to say, look, I can only speak from my own experience. Please, you know, you need to go deeper and find the other people who can support you in this. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, you cannot reasonably expect it to carry and convey the whole experience of a community. Because even within the disability community, it is so diverse. So diverse. And so it is about, you know, what is it that I bring to this situation? How can I do that in a way in which I feel comfortable and effective? And if necessary, where else can I go both for my own support, but also to refer people on? Yeah, for sure. Oh, Em, you're an utter legend, amazing. So incredible. Um, yeah, all those things you just said were just so important and um, are really game changers for all of us within the biz. And we all need to be aware of those things in yeah. terms of looking after ourselves and self-preservation and barriers and, but also, you know, having the courage to take up space. I think it's really and cool. You know, like I've, I've been in this industry now for a, seven years and these are lessons that I'm still learning yeah for but sure. It's, so it's an ongoing process so I'm saying all these things but I don't want anybody to think that I think that it's simple or yeah. easy or that I get it right all the time because I don't mm. and I won't and that's okay too. Even as a diverse artist, you will get things wrong. Because mm -hmm. you're um, human. Because you're human, that's exactly right. I think that I'm sure you are gonna bring this up anyway, but um, I think that intersectionality um, is really important. Mm -hmm. So acknowledging the space for other diverse artists as well and again the diversity within our own communities and thinking about particularly when you get a bit more experience in this industry okay how can I make space um for other people as well yeah yeah an inclusive <laughs> space is inclusive for all yeah I guess yeah because I think we get so invested and I understand why this is because we have to struggle so much for it. But I think we get so invested in fighting for our own representation mm -hmm. and things like that, that we often forget other people as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's not and shouldn't be a, you know, this is not the oppression Olympics. For sure. I don't like playing that game. <laughs> yeah. I guess, yeah, it's a matter of others having our backs and we have to have others' backs yeah. and that's how we move yeah. forward. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And I, but also saying, again, that that doesn't mean that you bear the responsibility for everybody. There's yeah, for sure. So much that you can do, but it's about that level of awareness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. important. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about um one of my favorite projects of yours, um, Groundhog Night. Yeah. I, as I said to you before, before you started um going live, I am a bit biased. It's one of my favorite short films. Um, I, if people haven't seen it, I believe they can access it on iView. It's still on iView. It just got replayed on the ABC 
Um, so yeah, it's still on iView. You can love have... that. Yay. Yeah. Um, do you mind? So you wrote and also performed in that film, yes. um, short film. Did you also produce that one or no? I didn't. Oh, okay. No, um, that was but... produced by Bus Stop Film. Of course, yeah, but um, yeah, definitely a key creative. Can you tell us a bit a bit about the film for people who haven't seen it? And... <laughs> yeah. And how you came up with the, um, I really want to know how you came up with the premise of it because it's so specific but also like so, sounds a bit wanky, but so universal at the same time. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a film. yeah, I'm pretty proud of this project. Um, mm-hmm. So in terms of like, Groundhog Night is a comedy drama film about a family um that is grieving and also living kind of with the ups and downs of of supporting someone with a disability and I think that it was important for me to make this film for kind of a number of reasons in that so often and you know this writing we see disability as something that is tragic and that is so hard on people but it also you know living with disability also has really funny moments as well and and really poignant moments so I really wanted to try and capture that diverse experience and and nuanced experience and put it on screen Mm -hmm. um but on a personal level, I like to say that it's a bit of a love letter to my family and the family dynamic that, that I have been lucky enough to have. Um, because a lot of the events and the sort of character dynamics are things that have drawn from my own life the caveat that I will put on that is that my grandparents unlike the grandparents in the film are incredibly supportive and not at all you know ableist (laughs) so I'll say that um (laughs) uh, but yeah so it was a real it was a passion project for me um we you know not to give away the ending of the film for people who haven't seen it Mm. but um that event happened to me in real life and um we thought that that you know as a family we thought that that was really funny and would make for a really great film so great you know, I got the opportunity and I made it. Cool. With, with thanks to Bus Stop Films and Create New South Wales. Yeah, incredible New organization. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, and so when you're right, you said that um, Groundhog Night is a drama comedy. Um, yeah. When you're writing a film, you said, well, for this project, you drew on a great level of truth. But when you're writing something that's a dramedy, um, as a writer, how do you find the nuances of the light and dark and the different shades of grey um, when you're exploring those concepts within a short film parameter? Is it something that you find difficult or you just go with your creative flow? I kind of work a lot in the drama comedy space mm-hmm. because I think that is a very truthful space because life itself, I guess, is shades of light and dark. So what's important to me is not so much genre, but what is truthful and yes. what is most, uh, pertinent to the message that I, or the, the, the point that I want to make. Mm-hmm. I've certainly made films that are not at all in that comedy um, space. Mm. Um, 
you know, as more of a political statement and things like that. Um, but it's just really finding what is the best medium for the the what I'm trying to get across. Um, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. But yeah, I think Germany is a space that I'm comfortable in because for me, it feels very truthful. Mm -hmm. And also, it's what I like to consume. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So oh. that's good too. Awesome. Well, you were, we were talking before we went live again, um, and you were mentioning you've still been very busy producing and writing um, from home within this two-year pandemic we're living in. Um, how have you been going working from home? And I guess the age-old question, like, um, staying productive and staying inspired and all those barriers that we all face. How's that been going? Um, you know, there are peaks and troughs. I'm yes. not going to say it's been, you know, I haven't, I'm not Taylor Swift. I haven't <laughs> stayed entirely productive <laughs> throughout this whole pandemic. Fair. But, um, yeah, it really is just, I think, the whole question of staying productive, particularly within something that is unprecedented as this pandemic has been, um, it's not possible to be productive all the time. Mm -hmm. And so in those times where you're not as productive and not as motivated, what I would suggest is go watch things and read things and find what your inspiration is because that's part of the job as well. Mm. Um, it's about feeding your soul and finding the people that you look up to in the industry um, who inspire you and things like this. Um, but then it is like, I have been doing lots of things. So it's about taking baby steps and setting goals and doing all that kind of good stuff and always keeping self-care front of mind because um, I think that's really important. Yeah, for sure. As artists and human beings. Yeah. yeah, and let's all take care of our mental health mm -hmm. as well. Pretty integral. Yeah. Yeah, cool. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, totally, for sure. Um, so is there anything that's coming up for you that you can talk about? Because sometimes we're working on things that are a bit hush-hush, but is there anything that you're really excited for that's on the horizon for you? I definitely am. Um, I'm working on a lot of um, screen projects at the moment. So I'm working on um, adapting my short film Groundhog Night into a TV series, mm -hmm. uh, which is fun. And that's kind of interesting. I'm also um, working on adapting a play that I wrote into a sort of mini series type thing. Um, and I'll see where that goes. But that's been kind of cool as well in terms of looking at something that comes from a theatre space and how to transpose that onto screen. I think. Um, it's good to be able to work in a variety of mediums because they mm -hmm. give you different uh, things and you can explore different things in them. Um, yeah. So yeah. So what have you found now that you're working on projects that are transitioning across mediums? Have you found any real stark differences between the two and things that you've become really aware of that you need to maybe tweak or yeah obviously I think 
screen is much more of a, you can convey more things visually on screen. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think performance is quite often stripped back mm -hmm. and more sort of, in, you can convey more internal um, things in a performance perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that makes any sense no, at all. No, totally does. Just make uh, sound like a wanker. No, you but... sound like a professional. <laughs> you sound very, very in the know. Cool. <laughs> um, we'll go with that. Good. Um, yeah, look, it's been fun dipping in and out of different mediums. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, great. So coming into tomorrow and coming into International Day of People with Disability, um, is there anything you think that people can be really mindful of in terms of we spoke before about these big conversations, you've got to be really nuanced and kind of got to be strategic and open to the way we talk about these big things but is there anything in particular you think people can be really aware of, of when coming to coming to working alongside or employing or supporting um, disabled people within our industry yeah I saw a really good post on this on Facebook actually the other day mm -hmm. um, where it was things like I think on International Day of People with Disability, often the media tends to veer into inspiration porn, mm -hmm. which for people who don't know are stories and things of people overcoming their disability and being so inspiring for things like just walking down the street and getting out of bed in the morning. <laughs> so being aware of those kinds of things and the narratives that kind of get perpetuated um, and, and equally what, what stories are being left out and how we can kind of address that and how mm -hmm. you as a person can do something about that. Mm -hmm. um, and also not relying on the same people with disability in your circles to be the educators and to tell you when something is wrong or, you know, don't be tagging your friends with disability when you see things that are ableist, like, yeah. check this out. Like, we don't need to see that. We, yeah. we know you know <laughs> um, sure. so those are just some I would say common things to be aware of yeah yeah and I um, think they're all really important things yeah yeah and again it's kind of um it's kind of um things that people can just kind of common sense things but I think in this space people can be really uh, scared and what kind of what you alluded to before people are scared of saying or doing the wrong thing so they won't say or do anything in fear of yep. getting it wrong and um yeah 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 just be ready and willing to learn I guess and expose yourself to things that you may not have been exposed to find out the artist you know, there's more than just me and Bridie who are doing, you know, things in this space. There are, right, great, there are great disabled artists. So if you're looking for a great way to spend um, International Day people with disability, start by a sort of looking up the people in our community who are doing this great work um, and familiarise yourself with, with who they are and what they make work about and what they say 
and how you can be supportive of that. Yeah, yeah, it's so important because, as you said, like some of the biggest challenges and barriers are actually um, being given a platform and being given an audience and taking up yeah. space. So if people can help us bridge that gap a little bit, I think that'll be a pretty powerful thing. Yeah. And supporting yeah. up and coming, um, you know, disabled and diverse artists. Like we Absolutely. all start somewhere. And being aware that the industry is open to people. So if you know of people who maybe want to be performers or writers or things like that and they think that you know the industry is inaccessible to them give them that support and tell them that we're ready and willing to open them with with to welcome them sorry with open arms yeah um yeah for sure, yeah. Um, Emily, we were joking before, again, before we went online on live, um, that we always end up catching up and having a big chat around this time type of year for time of year for International Day of People with Disability. Um, now that hopefully, fingers crossed, fingers and toes, um, COVID's kind of calming down again. I hope we actually get to have a proper catch up in person. Um, please but yes. for the next year what are you most excited for um what are you doing you mentioned you just want to invigorate your soul and you're aware of why you're doing what you're doing um and you always keep that front of mind um what are you excited for what type of practices will you be taking on challenges you have in mind um i know it's kind of a broad <laughs> kind of airy fairy question but yeah any thoughts yeah look um I just want to keep making my own work and making work that I'm proud of and collaborating with with great artists in this space and people who really want to be inclusive um I don't you know I have a steady a uh, producing job um, mm -hmm. that I'm very proud of and that will continue into next year. But I'm also excited, not just for work, but um, I'm about to be an auntie. So that's... Wow. Um, that, You're Arnie M. That's exciting. Yes, I'm Arnie M. So that's pretty exciting as well. That's the most thing I'm excited about I think um but professionally yeah I'm just excited to see where the wind takes me I'm certainly waiting on a few things at the moment which I think we all are at this mm -hmm. time of year um just to see what lands and that's really exciting because you never know what's gonna happen I guess yeah and I think that's the big part of this industry is just almost keeping that, oh, I've got a fly, I'm going everywhere, um, is keeping that optimism and keeping that hope alive. Is that something that you really um, try and cultivate within yourself? Yeah, definitely resilience. I don't think you survive in this industry, particularly in these times. It's become really evident to me. Um, how important resilience is. Mm, and um, how do you maintain your resilience? I think by connecting with people both inside and outside of the yeah. industry, mm -hmm. there is more, as much as I love my work and I love this industry and all the people in it, there is more to life than that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to remember that that you are not you are not your job <laughs> you are a person who does a job so that when inevitably there are times when you're not working quite so much and that you're questioning you know we all go through periods where we question our relevance and things like that yeah 
Um, but I think in those times, remembering that you are more than what this is mm -hmm. and life is more than work. And uh, okay. for sure, that's so important. Yeah, even though we bring it all that we are to our work, we're not defined by our work. Absolutely. Yeah, cool. Well, Emily Dash, thank you so much for joining me today and us today. Um, I really appreciate your time. No, that's okay. Did we have any uh, questions or anything? I don't think so. None have come through the chat. Do you have any final thoughts for me? No, just that it's been a pleasure. I love talking to you so much. Good <laughs> luck know. with everything you're doing. <laughs> I'm sure we will see each other again shortly or Amazing. at least sometime in the next 12 months <laughs> absolutely absolutely and yeah thank you everybody for joining us and i just want to say thank you to our Auslan interpreters kelly and kerry really appreciate you being here and yes happy thursday happy international day of people with disability for tomorrow and we will see you next time <laughs>